EQT Live Online. I am your host and moderator, Wendy H. Lewis. Good evening and thank you for joining us. The aim of this evening's discussion is to address the crime situation in Trinidad and Tobago. This is part two. If you missed part one, there will be a link in the comments on TTT Live Online, the Facebook platform. As I continue to engage experts in the field of policing and law enforcement, I am doing this with solutions in mind. We will be answering some of your questions at the end of each interviewee. Please be guided to keep your comments clean and respectful, avoiding racist and or inappropriate and or offensive statements. This evening's theme is in defense of a nation under siege. Let's discuss crime. The discussion will be moderated in four parts. Firstly, I would engage our first interviewee, Acting Commissioner of Police, Mrs. Harewood Christopher. Second segment will be taking your questions for a few minutes. The third segment, I will be joined by the Honorable Fitzgerald Hines, Member of Parliament and Minister of National Security. Finally, a Q&A segment where you will be able to ask the Honorable Minister a few of your questions as well. Allow me to introduce our first guest. Mrs. Erla Harewood Christopher, Acting Commissioner of Police, has a long and distinguished career. Mrs. Christopher joined the police service in 1982 and gradually moved up the ranks. Mrs. Christopher is currently the Acting Commissioner of Police. Mrs. Christopher holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Public Sector Management from the University of the West Indies, St. Augustine, and a Master's degree in Applied Criminology and Police Management from the University of Cambridge in the UK. She's also a candidate for the Master's degree in Strategic Leadership and Management, and has done a number of attachments and leadership courses at various institutions in Jamaica, India, and the US, Washington DC, to be precise. Mrs. Christopher, good evening and welcome. Good evening, Wendy, and good evening to our viewing public. How are you? I am blessed. And highly favored. And highly favored. Amen. Can you define your role as Acting Commissioner of Police for the benefit of the viewers, please? Okay. As <clears throat> Commissioner of Police, Section 123-1A of the Constitution defines the role of the Commissioner. Mm -hmm. In a nutshell, what I will tell you, the, commissioners, the Commissioner of Police is responsible for providing the strategic direction of the service, for ensuring the efficient and effective management of its resources, financial and human resources. And what I will want to add, the role of the Commissioner in achieving the mandate of the service is to be able to influence uh, and motivate the officers to achieve our objectives. As acting COP, are there any restrictions or limits versus if you were the actual COP? Actually, there is none. A confirmation just is a confirmation. Mm -hmm. The duties are the same. same. There are no limitations. No limits. No restrictions. No restrictions, no. What gaps have you identified and addressed since you assumed the role of Acting Commissioner? Wendy, I wouldn't want to talk about um, so much as gaps. Mm -hmm. Crime fighting is dynamic, is ever changing. So what we do is really review our strategies. Okay. It is important that we review strategies. So we, I look at the challenges we have facing us. So the challenge of the escalating crime, the mm -hmm. murders, the illegal firearms, those are the, so we look at ensuring that we, as much as possible, try, much to, as reasonably possible. try yes. to contain the murders, yes. Crime is being rated based on the number of homicides. To date, the 24th day in the year, we are at 41. What is your strategy to combat crime? Okay. Particularly as we lead up to the carnival with a thousand, thousands of revelers expected. Okay, Wendy. We are focusing on dismantling our criminal gangs, mm -hmm. the seizure of 
illegal weapons. We are harnessing because we because we work evidence based. Right. You know. Mm -hmm. So we we harness the intelligence because the intelligence is what is guiding all of our operations. Yes. And what is important to note, Wendy, even up to today, we had a nationwide we had nationwide activities all geared to coming down to the carnival. So we uh. are not waiting until carnival right. to put our strategies in place. Yeah. So we are doing our exercises, our stop and search exercise, our roadblocks, house searches. We are actually targeting all our known offenders. And I'm seeing that. You're yes. everywhere. Yes, we're everywhere. <laughs> Your role as acting COP is independent. Are there any challenges in working in tandem with any other stakeholders in your effort to combat crime? Not at all, you know. As a matter of fact, I share a close working relationship, networking with our partners under the Ministry of National Security, Security. Mm -hmm. the Trinidad and Tobago Defence Force, the Trinidad and Tobago Prison Service, the Customs and Excise Division, the Immigration Department. So, you know, we collaborate and I can say, actually, daily. Yeah, that's you know? important. And um, we have that extra close relationship with the Trinidad and Tobago Defense Force, where, you know, we actually, as you would notice, we have the joint patrols. Yes. And we have joint exercises. So we have a great, great networking with the other agencies. There's an issue as it relates to the lack of trust within the TTBS. Is this being addressed? Oh, yes. And how do we adjust, address the trust issue? About the, and that is address how we carry about ourselves, our duties, our visibility, what we would stress, even though sometimes you'll have activities that goes against that. Mm -hmm. what we have we work within the law within the confines of the law right and we would want to express that to, to persons you know even though you would have instances mm -hmm. of police and what what um, the country might, <laughs> might refer to as abuse of power mm. you know those incidents are not welcomed and they are kind of far, far between. Few and far between. Few and far between, you know. Okay. So, um, but we need our citizens to realize that they must be law abiding. Over the years, we have become a lawless, lawless society. What do you think is the root of that lawlessness? Oh, I think we have lost, as a, as a people, we have lost our moral values to an extent, mm. our ethical values. And um, I think persons need to go back to God. How, how do some God. of them go back to a God that they don't know? Ah, and that is why I, I refer to losing our, our moments. Yes. And, you know, even the crime situation in the country, mm -hmm. the police has a major role to play. But so too, the other agencies. We have the church. We have hmm. the schools. Right? We have the communities. So probably it's a time to really ask and call out the religious leaders to do a bit more. And the schools? Well, probably we need to, we need to ask our... But the schools team. are the ones that push the creator out, you know. But you know, the schools did that but I can, I, I can then say that, okay, but well, we have laws. 
And we have parents. And we have, yes, we have parents. And guardians. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Parents and guardians, but then you you also spoke about who will teach them. So we still come back to the church, bringing God in, bringing God back in, the communities, the extended families. Mm. I I hear you loud and clear, but sometimes when you have to get into the mind of some of these young people and these children. The mindset in 2023 and the mindset in the 80s when I was at school without giving away my age is a completely different mindset. We have access to the internet and people are searching for different things other than what they should be searching for. I grew up in church. I had Sunday school and youth group and all these different things. This generation, a wide percentage of them do not have that. And as you rightfully said, it, the community has to get involved because it takes a village to raise a child. But then sometimes the perpetrators come in from the said village. So then those individuals in the village now lose trust in the same village. So it's a vicious cycle. Right. And that is why our adults mm -hmm. need to really take control and make their contribution. So what about if the adults in the community do a little more to bring them, to bring the youths together. What about if instead of allowing the children mm -hmm. all that excess time on the computers mm -hmm. to bring them outside, play some sports? I like sports. I like that you mentioned sports because sports is really an initiative that really changes your mindset, keeps you focused, keeps you out of mischief, technically speaking. Technically. Yeah. So sports is a good tool to use. I noticed that we would have touched on it earlier. I noticed an increase in police presence in unusual areas. So I think that's part of your strategy oh, yes. that, that you mentioned. And this strategy is working because I had to do some diversion to get here as, as well. As a female acting COP, what do you believe you bring to the rank? A different perspective. A perspective, a unique one. Mm -hmm. I bring the perspective of a woman. Mm -hmm. A mother, yes, a wife, an aunt. I bring compassion, sensitivity. Are you saying that the men are not sensitive, Commissioner? I bring intuition. Men are sensitive, but do you think men are more sensitive than women? I would not want to answer that <laughs> <laughs> for fear. <laughs> Of, of, of being attached tomorrow and for the rest of the week. <laughs> but I think, I mean, we, we understand. I mean, it was my pleasure to see a female at the helm because I am one, I'm a gender-based violence activist. I, I really think that, you know, times have changed and women are stepping into their rightful place because we were branded for some things back in the day and we're no longer doing those things. We have people doing those things for us. So to see the empathy that women bring, we, we do have a level of discernment. Men are very oh, yes. emotional, you know. They just have a little pride. So they kind of hide it in a corner. So I'm not looking in the direction of the minister at all. So I'm just saying, you know, men, we have it. Yes. And we tend to take control. And I'm really looking forward to your continuance and um, what you bring to the table. Let's get into some touchy waters now. So finally, let's discuss the issuance of these firearm user lies. On the 4th of November last year, young, ambitious teacher and attorney at law, Ms. Keisha Bostick from South Drayton Street, San Fernando, collected multiple gunshots, they couldn't even count, by her estranged husband, who then cowardly committed suicide. Within 24 hours, it was confirmed by the TTPS that he had five, four, four, four licensed firearms. How does a contractor get four licensed firearms? You know, when the issuance of firearms mm -hmm. is solely the prerogative of the commissioner. Mm -hmm. And um, a contractor, persons may apply for firearm yes. for various reasons. Mm -hmm. You may want a personal personal protection, mm -hmm. you may be uh, 
sport uh, for sports and purposes, you know, or you may be a hunter. So those are the criteria and the reasons persons can get multiple weapons. But, you know, rest assured, <laughs> the issuance of firearms will not be as liberal as it is as it was before. What we have in place now is a more a more rigid rigid mm -hmm. a more yeah a more rigid investigative team right working. So even persons applying for a firearm user's license would find the process a little bit longer. Right. And that is because of the stringent investigations that is going into the application. I want you to say that again, because they must understand why the process is lengthy and not be behaving inappropriately on radio programs and television. Say that bit again, why it's lengthy. There is a st st stringent, yes. stringent investigative process. Yes. Which must be complied with before the issuance of a fire user's license. And you all will not give any problems because it's the same length of time you have to wait for your visa and all these different things. And you do wait patiently. So there are a lot of stringent measures in place. Yes. Mrs. Christopher, let's take a break. We'll be right back. Get ready to close one chapter in our experience and prepare ourselves to surmount the challenges of an unknown future. This year, we cherish the return to some semblance of normalcy in our lives as the restrictions of the COVID-19 pandemic were gradually lifted. Today, we once again have the opportunity to join family and friends who are so close, yet we were constrained to love them from a distance. From my unique vantage point as Acting Commissioner of Police, I can report that 2022 was another challenging year for the TTPS, yet we were steadfast in executing our mandate of confronting crime and working relentlessly to ensure the safety and security for all. The full capability and capacity of the TTPS as a law enforcement agency was tested and the organization maintained its focus and its determination to deter and detect crime and to apprehend offenders. How did we manage those demands? Having an appreciation of the reality and the complexity of our current security environment and the global challenges impacting crime generally, we worked diligently to operationalize our strategic plan 2022 to 2024, which was a roadmap for all our officers in the discharge of their responsibilities. As the dynamics of crime changed, we too, as an organization, had to rapidly adapt our approach in order to be proactive and effective in our fight against crime. We remained resilient and focused, and to a significant extent, succeeded in our efforts to keep our communities and citizens safe. We are all too familiar with the term going over and beyond the call of duty. Such were the demands placed on the rank and file of the organization. And I am pleased to report that the officers certainly rose to the occasion, despite the many challenges and for this, I wish to publicly acknowledge the contribution and the dedication and commitment of the officers and to thank them for their service to the nation. As we come to the end of the year, the realistic outlook for the TTPS is another challenging year of operations. While commentators will press reset, 
and begin a new count come January 1st. There is the need for an acknowledgement that there is nothing magical in fighting crime. Welcome back. If you are now joining us, you have tuned in to a discussion timely themed in defense of a nation under siege. Let's discuss crime, part two. Before the break, we had an engaging discussion with the acting commissioner of police, Mrs. Christopher, and we are about to discuss a few more things, and we will take a question from the Facebook Live audience. Mrs. Christopher, I'm noticing a lot of young people involved in crime. What do you attribute to this? What is your take on it? You know, it's interesting that you that they ask about the young people being mm -hmm. involved in crime. You know, I want to draw the country attention to the number of young men mm. who have lost their lives. Between the period 2018 to 2022, 100 and 11 young men between the ages of 15 and 19 lost their lives. Wow. Nine young boys under the age of 15. So I want to appeal to the public. I want to appeal to the mothers, the aunts, the sisters, the wives, the girlfriends. Hmm. I want to appeal to them. How many more must die wow. before we really take control? We need to steer them away from that gang culture. Yeah. I am sure there are mothers who really wish they had that control to pull their children away. Yes. From the gang. But they can't. But I am sure we can assist them. And I am appealing to all the people, the ladies out there, to reach out to us, reach out to the TTPS. We have 97 police youth clubs. We have police youth clubs in every area you can think of. What about reaching out to the youth clubs? How do they do that? Actually, you can go to any station. Any station. Any station, and you can get information about the youth club. If you're on Facebook, you mm -hmm. can get information about the youth clubs. 97 police youth 97 clubs. 97 police youth, active police youth What's clubs. What's the role of these youth clubs? The youth club really is geared towards making our youths productive citizens. The youth club, youth club leaders involved in various activities. Any age including limit? Including any age limit. Okay. Up to 25. Okay. Hmm? Cap at 25. So mm -hmm. we, we have, we assist with educational activities. Mm -hmm. We have homework centers. We have cultural activities. Okay. Yeah. We have steel bands. Steel bands, yes. Education, steel bands, anything Everything. with sport? Yes, we have sport. We have actually, right now we have our net netballers. Okay. Attending an international tournament. It's free, everything's free. Nothing is free, Wendy. Nothing is free. I'm just asking on behalf of those who would like to know. Nothing. Well, yes, it's free membership. Oh, so there's a free, free membership. Free membership, right? free membership of course. And then course. the initiatives have a cost. Hmm? Nothing. No cost to the membership. You see. But we provide. But of course, corporate, it's a cost to you, yeah, it's exactly, a cost to, to implement. Us, corporate citizens, yes, there's a cost. Wow. But it's well, it a free. welcome cost. No, and I really appreciate this, but I think this is something that I've been saying independently. 
and it's probably because there's a lot of police in my family, a lot. So I am kind of in the know with some of the things that are taking place, but that's just me as an individual. A lot of people aren't aware of these things. Do you think we, we uh, I'm saying we as if I'm a police officer, yeah, do you yeah. think your office in collaboration with maybe the TTPS and, and all the powers that be need to increase the communication? Well, you know, I'm surprised that you are not aware that I'm aware, are of, the aware club, of youth club because I worked with St. Clair Police Youth Club. But 97? No, that's a soothing to my heart. I'm very pleased to hear the amount of youth clubs we have and the fact that they can get involved. But I really didn't realize that it was so much. But so kudos to the TTPS on that initiative. Oh, thank you. You're most welcome. Because the youths, if we want to get to some solutions, we have to get to the root of the problem. And the root of these problems is with these youths. Yes. You mentioned about um, gang culture. Yes. And that a lot of the young people are gravitating to gang culture. What do you think is attracting them? Hmm. What does the gang leader give? I have no idea. The gang, leader, the, gang, <laughs> <laughs> the gang leaders provide finances. You think it's money alone they're using? At, you know, at, sometimes, you know, they provide that kind of artificial care and love. And they give the members a sense of belonging. That's it. You see that there? Giving them a sense of belonging. Yes. That's it, because a lot of these youths are crying out for attention in different ways. Yes. A lot of these young people feel abandoned at times. A lot of these young people feel as if nobody cares. And then someone, be it a gang leader or otherwise, is very influential because some of the things that they want to accomplish and they want to achieve in life is being done through the gang leader. So it's like a form of gratitude. Yes. And that is what, and that is what the gang leaders do. So they hold you. So after a while, you feel obligated to them. Mm -hmm. And that is the, how now they get you know, to commit criminal activities because, you, because of that feeling that you know they indebted to you. So these youth clubs, I hope and pray, have some sort of initiative where they're dealing with the mindset. Oh, yes. Because they must understand their worth and they must understand that this is a serious trade-off. Yes. So why is this person maybe giving me money for a particular thing in exchange for me committing a crime? What are the chances of me being caught? So why is it would have given me X amount of money to do a particular thing while you're spending your 10 years or your 20 years or whatever years you get for that particular thing, they are going about their business. So I think the youths need to have more of a visionary mindset. And I'll be more than happy to work with any of these youth clubs. Well, through when, the Corporate Training Academy. I seriously will. Okay, great. So we have 77 station districts. My God. So within the 77 station districts, you have the 97 police youth clubs. Wow. Question concerning the firearms from the Facebook Live. Are businesses like pharmacies and groceries, etc., prioritized when it comes to the issuance of firearms? When you say prioritize, what, well, what, 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 what I, is meant by prioritize? I assume, I'm just assuming on behalf of the writer, that because of the level of robberies or break-ins from these supermarkets and pharmacies, etc., is it that they will take priority because of what is taking place with them? And I'll allow you to answer and then I would season it up. Okay. An application comes in. Mm -hmm. We have a period by which we would want to complete an application right. process. Mm -hmm. So we say within a period of three months mm -hmm. from application to processing. Okay. That's not long. No, it isn't. No, that is not long. Um, I think in response to this question concerning pharmacies, groceries, etc., in terms of aiming to get the firearms, one of the things you mentioned earlier concerning the community, partnering, etc. People also need, yes, you people who are watching me there, need to recognize as well that we all have a part to play. You yes. cannot just leave your business unattended and then aim for the firearm. You have to be more of a deterrent. Yes. Because some of these businesses, there's a pharmacy close to where I live, and they have someone with a battle that is not deterring anyone and they've been robbed three times. And it's because 
when they look at your establishment, they're not deterred. They're not even wondering if or not they're like, this is a perfect target here. So I think people need to engage in more activities and, and initiatives that will secure your premises with wisdom. Yes, what we refer to as target hardening. Target hardening. You see, I knew I would learn some things on this program this evening. Target hardening. Target hardening. So you make, make your it harder. business harder for the criminals to attack. That's all. Wow. Target hardening. Mrs. Christopher, closing comments. Wendy, I would want to reach out again to the community, yeah. to the citizens. We cannot do it alone. Agreed. We need everybody's support. And when we say, if you see something, say, say something. something, we mean it. Because if you look, and I'm going back to the fact that the firearm mm -hmm. is our greatest enemy. A, over 80% of our murders were committed by firearms. Right. So you can imagine... But these are not the licensed ones? No. Okay. But illegal firearms. Illegal firearms, okay. So can you imagine what Trinidad would be like if we did not have all these illegal firearms? Yes. And... What we have noticed, the high-powered weapons that are being used. Mm. These are not pistols that could be hidden in your pocket. No. So persons must see. So, again, I am appealing to the citizenry. If you see something, say something, say something so that we can achieve our mandate in making Trinidad and Tobago a safer place for all of us. I, I, I hear you, but sometimes it's really difficult to make up your mind when you see something to say something. Because as I engaged Mr. West last week, saying something could get you a death as well. You know, that is that's sad. the reality of that's it. A, that's the reality, but where is the statistics to show that? How many persons really who um, give evidence and were killed and lost their lives? One is too much, Mrs. Christopher. <laughs> I agree. You so know how many people make reports? To, and that is why I want to appeal, to appeal again to use our numbers, use the numbers we provide. They don't five even five trust five. the numbers. Well, they can trust. They can trust my number. Don't give out your number. Yeah, they won't sleep. No, seven. <laughs> no, my number seven, <laughs> seven three six TTPS. Okay. That is a number. There for a that moment. is a number. Seven that... three six TTPS. Is this also a WhatsApp number? Yes, you can get WhatsApp on the number. Yes. Seven three six TTPS. That's not Simple. difficult to remember, to remember at all. At all. And you are assured confidentiality when you call it that number. I'm going to take your word for it. Mrs. Christopher, we have one final. They, this is specific for the commissioner. They're saying, you know, what, are being, what is being done um, with the use of law enforcement clothing? Well, a lot of people have the... I, I don't know if they're making them, but we have some talented people in Trinidad and Tobago, you know. I don't know if they're making them. I don't know if they're importing them. I don't know where they're getting them from. You know, um, so Wendy, what we are what we are doing now at the mm -hmm. TTPS, although some persons say we're going back in times, we want to focus on putting our police officers back in our gray and blue. Mm -hmm. Boys in blue. Boys in <laughs> yes, boys in blue. Now that that is to ensure that you know we take control of the illegal use of the other uniforms. Okay. Right? We wanna ensure officers who are 
providing particular duties. Mm -hmm. We have specific duties that will wear the camouflage uniform, right. specific duties for the tactical uniform. Okay. And then we have our gray and blue. Awesome. So we are trying to take control of that. And people, please get familiar and understand what the numbers mean, what everything means. So somebody come with something on the shoulder with 10 numbers. We haven't reached there yet. So it's obvious it's not real. I think we too have to do our own research and become educated within ourselves and stop depending on the government of the day or the commissioner or the minister or the this one. We of ourselves have to actually take responsibility. Mrs. Yes. Christopher, it was a pleasure and an honor speaking with you. Thank you so much. Thank we're going to take a break, and when we come back, we're going to have the man of the moment, the Honorable Fitzgerald Hines, Member of Parliament and Minister of National Security, when we come back. Let's take a break. ready to close one chapter in our experience and prepare ourselves to surmount the challenges of an unknown future. This year, we cherish the return to some semblance of normalcy in our lives as the restrictions of the COVID-19 pandemic were gradually lifted. Today, we once again have the opportunity to join family and friends who are so close, yet we were constrained to love them from a distance. From my unique vantage point as Acting Commissioner of Police, I can report that 2022 was another challenging year for the TTPS, yet we were steadfast in executing our mandate of confronting crime and working relentlessly to ensure the safety and security for all. The full capability and capacity of the TTPS as a law enforcement agency was tested and the organization maintained its focus and its determination to deter and detect crime and to apprehend offenders. How did we manage those demands? Having an appreciation of the reality and the complexity of our current security environment and the global challenges impacting crime generally, we worked diligently to operationalize our strategic plan 2022 to 2024, which was a roadmap for all our officers in the discharge of their responsibilities. As the dynamics of crime changed, we too, as an organization, had to rapidly adapt our approach in order to be proactive and effective in our fight against crime. We remained resilient and focused, and to a significant extent, succeeded in our efforts to keep our communities and citizens safe. We are all too familiar with the term going over and beyond the call of duty. Such were the demands placed on the rank and file of the organization. And I am pleased to report that the officers certainly rose to the occasion, despite the many challenges and for this, I wish to publicly acknowledge the contribution and the dedication and commitment of the officers and to thank them for their service to the nation. As we come to the end of the year, the realistic outlook for the TTPS is another challenging year of operations. While commentators will press reset and begin a new count come January 1st, there is a need for an acknowledgement that there is nothing magical in fighting crime. Welcome back to all of our viewers on TTT and TTT Live Online via the Facebook platform. If you are not joining us, you have tuned into a discussion in defense of a nation under siege. Let's discuss crime. 
Before the break, we had an engaging discussion with our first interviewee, Acting Commissioner of Police, Mrs. Erla Harewood Christopher. We took some questions and we are now back with the Honorable Fitzgerald Hines. Allow me to introduce him. The Honorable Fitzgerald Ethelbert Hines, Member of Parliament, was appointed Minister of National Security on April 19, 2021. Minister Hines has previous experience in the national security landscape. Having served as Minister of State in the Ministry of National Security from June 2004 to November 2007, Mr. Hines has made significant contributions to the enactment of legislation relating to the administration of justice in Trinidad and Tobago, including the Kidnapping Bill, the Firearms Bill, the Police Service Bill, the Police Complaints Authority Bill, and the Evidence Amendment Bill. Minister Hines is a former member of the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service, having enlisted in 1976. In 1979, he was appointed a training instructor, educating recruits in drill, the art of weapons, and martial arts. Prior to his appointment to the government of Trinidad and Tobago, he served as a practicing attorney at law for more than 20 years. He's a graduate of the Queen Mary and Westfield College, University of London, where he earned a Bachelor of Laws degree in 1986. In 1992, he obtained a Master's of Law degree specializing in government and constitutional law and received his legal education certificate from the Hugh Wooding Law School in 1995. Minister Hines, good evening and welcome. Good evening to you. How are you? I'm excellent, good, and getting better. Are you? Indeed. Mr. Hines, you're in the hot seat. Happy to be here. Awesome. Uh, for the course. I tell you, Minister Hines, today the crime rate stands at 41. Murder is seemingly spiraling out of control. As a minister with responsibility for the security of our nation, what would you like to say to Trinidad and Tobago as it relates to the crime situation? Well, clearly that kind of figure, well, for those of us in the know, mm -hmm. um, and looking at it from a statistical standpoint, the month of January of every of the past few years since mm -hmm. we've been paying attention tends to demonstrate high murder figures. I can't, maybe I'd have to leave that for the sociologists and the criminologists and the many opinion makers and shapers in Trinidad and Tobago. Why January and why that is so, but this is the state of affairs. But um, it really reflects the very extreme violent nature of the society and I venture to say the world because I have been paying attention to world events as well. Mm -hmm. A couple of days ago we had a mass shooting and I think it was California. Yes. Yeah. So you have that and of course the Commissioner of Police having spoken with you a while ago would have demonstrated the extent of the illegal firearms easily accessible to people as reckless and criminal as those who generate that kind of activity. So it's a combination of all of those things. It demonstrates, the, as I say, the extreme violent nature of the society, yes. the availability of these weapons, mm -hmm. and therefore we have to cope with it. The good thing is, uh, if I follow the trend from 2021, 2022, yes. all other categories of serious crimes from the statistics provided to me mm -hmm. by the Commission of Police, um, they seem to be heading south. Okay. But murders in particular, and of course, as the Commissioner explained a while ago, and as we have observed from our keen observation on these matters, the presence of automatic weapons, military-type assault weapons, mm -hmm. lends itself to far more, like happened today, double and triple yes. and quadruple and quintuple murder and uh, experiences. Yes. Uh, in the event I told you about, I think it was in Monterey or in California, I think about 10 people died and, and another 10 or 14 people injured, injured in the event. So these are the realities that we are faced with in the world and therefore all of the commendations and recommendations of the Commissioner, which I was pleased to witness for the last few moments, are quite opposite. And I too commend them to the people of Trinidad and Tobago, take it down. There are many awesome. ways you could resolve your differences. Mm -hmm. You don't have to run to violence like that, some small little thing. I know a fellow got shot in my community when I represented Love Until East Mover and when we got behind it, it was $10, $10. Oh. Mm -hmm. And I remember a particular day, a young man ran into my office, frightened to dead. And when I inquired of him, he owed another young man one day pay 
at that time, $250. And the young man, I went then, I left my office and I went to find the young man because I'd known where he lived, the area. So right. I went in, I inquired. Eventually, they pointed him out to me and I got a hold of him and I asked him about this. And yes, he was swearing he going to kill the man for $250. $250. Mm -hmm. At which point I took all the $250. I told him, well, look, I just spoke to the man. He gave me this $250 to bring for you. And that, that put an end to it. That happened. Wow. Yes. And they kill for less. You oh, match the good. nice sneakers in a dance, you're mm -hmm. up for death. Somebody tell them you say something or the yeah. girl look at you Easily twice, angered. they want to kill. Mm -hmm. Dotishly angered. <laughs> and <laughs> that's what's going on. <laughs> That's the world in which we live. Agreed. Minister, the government is responsible for policy making and legislation. The commissioner creates the crime plan and you in your capacity as the Minister of National Security provides the resources and the support to ensure that the plan is implemented. That's correct? Yeah, that's yes. largely correct. Just wanted to provide some clarity on the yeah. separation of powers. Do you believe that the illegal guns are passing through customs undetected? or more emphasis needs to be placed on our border control, or is it a bit of both? It's a bit of both, yes, yes. Which side is heavier um, than we which? We have some problems in Trinidad and Tobago. Yes. Um, we have to, from a, a physical and security standpoint generally, we have to tighten our border arrangements. We have discovered, we have seen, mm -hmm. is enough to suggest that our legal ports of entry is one of the major weaknesses. And of course, that involves complicity on the part of state officials. It is my belief that very few of these things can happen without the involvement of officials of the state okay. and the private companies, because there are some courier companies and um, mm. shipping company, I'm um, not shipping, courier companies yeah. that deal with some of these imports and distribution in the country. Okay. And they have employees too. It's part of the legal port structure and you have weaknesses there too, but that apart, you do have engagement, the weakness and the complicity on the part of state officials. And therefore, these are all some of the challenges you have. But before I continue on that, I also oh. wanted to say in respect of your first question, mm -hmm. as I contemplated it a little more, sure. um, you know, it is not only that kind of behavior that leads to some of the murders. There are people who coldly and calculatively decide they want to kill you because of your land, because they want yeah. your grandmother to dead fast, mm -hmm. all of these things. And they calmly go to some young, unthinking boy or young man, yes. offer him some money, yes. and he's quite prepared to do it as a job. You have that too, you know. Without thinking beyond. Yeah, some businessman in competition with mm -hmm. another one, all these kinds Different of human things. things. And so it's, it's, it's a very complex thing. And this is why I said even today in a conversation with my permanent secretaries at the Ministry of National Security, essentially what the police have to deal with here is curtailing the human spirit, human behavior. Some yeah. of the behaviors that we see are called crimes. Not all bad behaviors or sins are crimes. Agreed. Um, and those that are called crimes, the police pay attention to those. But at the end of the day, the root of this is human behavior, you know, selfishness, greed, hot-headedness, folly, weakness, all manners of things. Mr. Hans, why do you believe the youths are so angry? They're just angry. Well, yes, you know, you know what you put in, is what you get out and i heard you quite wisely make mention of rash shorty eyes well-known yes calypso the push ja the out. out yes you see yes and um one of the things whether it is i believe god is real of i course. pray mm -hmm. but there are some people don't believe that but at the end of the day and I believe God is real, but even if, just for the sake of this discussion, mm -hmm. God wasn't real, but you believed in God, mm -hmm. you believed in this ulterior being, this all-powerful, yes. all-knowing being, it humbles you as a little nothing human being. It makes you check yourself. It humbles you to, to a higher force. You follow? Yes, I do. So it's, it's just good, but God is real. If one submits himself to our creator, if one understands that it is God who made us and not ourselves, and it is through God that we are alive and that we all the things we thank him for and all the things we want, it is through him, yeah. then it tends to 
constrain your behavior regardless yes, of your religion. It will produce religion. fear of God. It will yeah, produce that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But when we push the creator out and when we feed the children pure violence, I happen to have been mm. in the company of the commissioner of the now commissioner of police in 2019. We attended a symposium to which the state was invited right. and I was among those and I was there and Madam Archie as well. And we were traveling for about four hours from the hotel where we stayed mm -hmm. to a tourist resort, a cavern as they call it, some caves down there. Right. And in that journey, I don't watch TV, I don't watch movies and so on. I don't have no time for that. I'm <laughs> my own star, right? I just make my own <laughs> thing. And then I spend my time dealing with more. I don't have too much time for entertainment. If anything, it's edutainment. It has to be a mixture of education and entertainment Understood. for me. Yes. Anyway, I'm a captive on this bus. And they put on a movie. And it's pure violence. Wow. When we got to our destination, I told them, you know, I said the star of that movie was the gun, you know, if you see gunfire. Wow. And obscene language was the co-star. Every two line is cuss word. Mother this and effing this and so on. Wow. And if that is what the children are being yes. taught and fed, the use mm -hmm. of those words come almost Naturally. automatically. Yes. yes. Violence comes axiomatically. And that is what, if you fill the children with that, then what do you expect? That's all they are taught. And then Madam Christopher and the rest of the police service in, and all the police services in all the region and the world have to deal with this. So it's yes. a very complex state of affairs. I think it comes right back to the mind, the mindset. I, I knew someone who used obscene language a lot, knew of this person, and people were complaining, why, why does this person, you know, curse so much? I said, listen to me. People who use obscene language every two words, there's a lack of vocabulary. I said, so when they do it, don't feel intimidated by it. Sometimes it's a play on words. You have to play with their mind. Why do you use obscene language for everything? that your vocabulary is limited? You have to hit them where it hurts and then they realize what it really isn't making much sense because you can't even get a sentence out of all the obscenities. But at the end of the day, as I would have shared with Mrs. Christopher earlier, the mind, we have to get into the mind of these young people. Why do they do what they do? And you know, when I was, you know, I, I, I used obscene language too, at a certain time. Oh, back in the day? Well, oh, yes, yes, I don't bother Just to checking. use, I don't bother to use it in my vocabulary. Oh, it's definitely. Based this on your theory. This is what I'm on saying. Your <laughs> my vocabulary is sufficiently, <laughs> correct. Uh, you know, um, able to deliver my thoughts without them. But the point is that um, I said to myself, I rationalized a long time ago. I you said, you know, in the God has given me two eyes and I could see something good and I could see something bad. And yes. two nostrils, I can smell something good, smell something yes. bad. And two ears yes. and two hands. You see? But he gave me one, one mouth. And when you get up in the morning now and you ask God for guidance, Mother Lachmi, you see? Rastafari for guidance and blessing and thank him for all the many things that he has bestowed upon us. And then two minutes after that, the same mount, you go on using them foul, dirty, nasty words. I just pity a God, just cringe when he hear it. Wow. You understand? So it is that that persuaded me. Just like cigarette smoking, you know, I smoke cigarettes too. As a teenager, you're coming up, you're playing man in school yes. and so on. My father is now dead and my mother, so may they rest in peace. They wouldn't know, but we did it. And, um, <laughs> you know, one day in reading Malcolm X's autobiography, um, the story is told that Alex Haley, who was writing the autobiography, came mm -hmm. into Malcolm's car. Yes. And Malcolm, and he had a cigarette. And Malcolm looked at him as a very disciplined minister of religion, Temple Number no. 7 in New York at the time, told him, that makes you the first person to ever smoke a cigarette in this automobile. You know, it used to be called that in those days. And Alex Haley said that he got the message loud and clear, he put it out. And then Malcolm X would go on to describe a smoker as fire on one end and a mm. fool on the other. Wow. And when I read that, I took the decision, I will never put a cigarette in my mouth again. Oh, of words. Because God didn't make me no fool. Hmm. Agreed. And that's why we have to read, we have to fill our minds with positive things. We can find role models. Madam Christopher is an outstanding role Indeed. model to young people because 
no privileged background like me, like you, mm -hmm. Dr. Rowley, and so many more people. Find positive models, examples, follow them. And there's so much. And if you don't find it in your family, as I did in mine, because my father was my strongest role model. Yes. He still lives in me today. And I convey some of my father's spirit to my sons. And I would like them to reflect that spirit because he was a highly principled man, unlettered, but honest to the core. Couldn't touch nothing that wasn't yours. Yes. He was that kind of man and that imposed itself on me. And I imposed that on mine. And you know, if you can't find it in your family and you can't find it in the community, Bob Marley was also one of my inspirations in this life. I think he's an inspiration for quite a number of people. A, a, a corporal in the, in the police service, 6509 as he then was, Corporal Neil, an instructor when I joined the police service and I watched Neil, so I just wanted to be like him, walk like him, talk like him. Wow. May the Lord bless him. He impressed himself upon me. So when I became an instructor in the police service, it was the spirit of Neil in my, in my soul. So you had something to actually follow. And he trained me as an instructor. He trained me to become an instructor. So he, he lives in me. That is awesome. And it's a perfect example. Minister, we have had several instances with drugs at the port up until last week on the 16th of January. Drugs were found during a police exercise, and I commend the TTPS for those findings. Is it that the current law is, is either not a deterrent or there is no fear and respect for the TTPS? Money, money, money. The law is a deterrent. We have, I, the other day I saw the commission of police in Jamaica, and it went viral in Trinidad, and people said to me, we need to amend our laws to do what Jamaica is doing life sentence and uh, 15 years if you're caught with a firearm and you know that sort of thing our law is worse than that yeah, 25 years yeah, it's life not one sentence day. yeah we we our laws are i don't think the issue is the one of law no because the law is clearly not a deterrent right but no i don't think we need more stringent laws per se what we already we need? have them mm -hmm. so the motivation that people get for money and for things and the easy route is where it's really at. So I think that the imposition of law enforcement in it, that is really the deterrent, where they get to know that you are more likely to be caught. And as mm. you make the decision about the drugs or the gun or the crime, there's a, there's a, there's a, a, a judgment that takes place in your spirit. Right. An assessment, a balancing act, mm -hmm. gain on the one hand and pain on the next. And if you assess, that the gain will outweigh the pain, then you take the chance. But if the law enforcement situation is where it's at, and you feel confident that Madam Christopher and Madam Archie and them will get you, so it's bringing back the as you make the, the balancing problem. theory in your brain, you realize this one, you're heading you for leave jail. This alone, yeah. You're heading for jail. And also the forfeit laws we have, if you are convicted of certain offenses under the law, they come and seize everything related to the crime. Wow. But the laws exist. So I believe and I have mm -hmm. faith that the law enforcement and coming on that topic, I as minister am quite pleased in my heart. And I told this country that at the end of last year, I don't know if they took note. I described it in metaphor as a situation where the police service was going to the gym every morning and every mm. evening, putting on policing muscle, improving their technique, improving the technologies they use, improving their strategies. You heard the commissioner say a while ago that they review strategies almost on a All daily the time. basis. Yes. You see? And I'm seeing that and I'm seeing the responses of the police within the last few weeks. And I'm seeing the responses of the society in response to the police. And I notice that that's what they want. They want to see the police. And I have found, to the credit of the commission and the police service, the police service seems to be coming alive. Because I believe the 7,000 men and women of the police service and the resources that they now have and the laws that we have in place and this small 1.4 million space that we have, mm -hmm. I believe if all the police service really comes alive, as I am seeing signs of now, today, right, some killing took place. And within moments, the police intercepted that suspected murderer, you know. And Very from information good. available to them, they're looking at other things. 
and we have seen within recent days and weeks that's in St. Augustine and you just said it too mm -hmm. the police seem to be everywhere I go in little backwater places in this country and I see two police on the motorcycle I see a police patrol everywhere it's so uh, this is what we want and I am pleased about that as minister the police service seems to be coming alive more productivity I've said before you go on to the next question there sure. are three major impediments to our national well-being growth development everything one productivity i believe if we as a workforce including the police service mm -hmm. steps up our game yes and do the business we will impose ourselves better we'll see more growth more development everything in trinidad and tobago that's one too many of us don't give full value for our space for our job for our occupation for our money i'm telling you that Mm. without fear of contradiction okay secondly corruption and complicity secondly okay. corruption and complicity the first is lack of productivity right okay the second is corruption and complicity corruption interferes with everything because Correct. if you have a very expensive national coastal radar system by way of an example this does not exist that i'm aware of i'm just giving an example, example. yes and the operators of that can see everything that is happening coming into Trinidad and Tobago by air or by sea. Mm -hmm. And you have a corrupt person there. You see what they want to see. The value of all of that is lost. Yeah. A whole police station could be lost to everybody. There are about, I think there might be about 40 some uh, the, uh, uh, police stations in the country. A whole police station, mm -hmm. whole thing could be lost. Wow. If just by one person or person or persons see mm -hmm. and the third problem of course in Trinidad and Tobago I don't want to say this too loudly whisper is yes, yes this is part of the culture that leads a fair lawless Bacana. attitude yeah. we get that yeah we fight fight and scrummage over everything yes. in every office everywhere is only in fighting and back and all and thing there's a serious impediment in this country that's just part of the culture that is why in this way i in that sense i try to be on trinidadian i don't like no back and all. i get it something is a problem you see it you use your brain your intellect you sit down with the experts the police or whoever the chief of defense staff whoever mm -hmm. and you identify this is the problem you apply your intellect how is it to be solved mm -hmm. this is what you're going to do and you just go quietly and do it systematic approach yeah. minister let's take a break we'll be right back Life events are constantly unfolding. Each event creates a memory. The events won't last forever. But you can let me record your memory and make it last forever.
each video I make, I try to make it better than the last. Let's make your memory last forever. We're back with the Honorable Minister of National Security, Mr. Fitzgerald Hines. We are discussing the crime situation in Trinidad and Tobago. Minister, welcome back. Every year, the TTPS is recruiting. Therefore, it's fair to say that manpower is not the issue. Can you describe the recruitment process and how has it been improved over the years to combat the magnitude of deception being detected? First of all, um, the police service now consists of about 7,000 7, persons altogether. Mm -hmm. And that figure is generally maintained. That is to say, although they recruit persons, there's the attrition rate. On yes. the other end, people are retiring, Tiring. medically mm -hmm. unfit, and those kinds of things. So it's a process that mm -hmm. is ongoing. In terms of how it has improved over the years, for many years now, quite properly, the police service began to democratize its recruitment process. By that, I mean to place the faces, the addresses, and the names of all applicants. In in the newspapers mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so that the public will have an opportunity to participate in that recruitment yes. process. You see a crook there? Yes. The right. Yes, yes, yes. According to Chogdas. You know Chogdas from Mrs. Virginia's Alzheimer's disease. She from the big o, she when she see a crook, she know one. She say look like a crook, member of the family. You know, you don't know the calypso. Mr. Hans, you're a lot older than I am. Well, it's a recent calypso, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, I'm a lot older than you, but it's a recent gallop, so <laughs> creative like it. Anyway, and um, they have democratized the recruitment process right. in that regard. Um, of course, the basic requirement is five CXC passes, mm -hmm. math and English, and, and three others. Mm -hmm. And of course, a clean bill of health in respect of, yes, health, you have yes, to be physically of fit. And of course, in terms of um, your record. Mm -hmm. You have to have a clean record with law enforcement. Yes. And the of course, of background character. checks are done in the district and so on. And this is consistent with all the arms of national security because mm -hmm. the police service in its plan and in its design, they know what they want of a police officer. Okay. So when they select, recruit, and train someone at the end of that process, they are supposed to have a certain kind of individual. Who is a police officer? What is a police officer? Yes. What do we expect the public expect of him or her? Mm -hmm. Someone who is learned, someone who understands police duties, someone who has integrity, someone in whom the public can have easily have trust and confidence, yes. and, and, and all of those other things. Um, so they train up as well during the six or eight months they spend inside of there and they're very careful in the interview process looking for certain things. They are tested psychometric testing as well to see okay. the personality Good. types and the way persons would react. So all of these things go into the process. I'm trying to find the right person and trying to find the right spirit and trying to find the right energy to match with what the police service ought to be, which is about righteousness as opposed mm -hmm. to wrongteousness. Am I permitted to use that word? Of course you are. Yes, indeed. Because I know the word. You do? Yes. Yes, indeed. Yes, very familiar. And so that process continues. Recently, and, and this is across the board, the Defense Force has done tremendous recruitment and training okay. in the last, since our Minister of National Security, I would have attended about three passing on parades okay. at the Defense Force across the four formations of that force. But recently, and the same holds for the police service, I mandated the chief of defense staff in the company with the commissioner of police to ensure that not a single person enters Tetran Barracks to start no training unless and until the commissioner of police can let me as minister of national security be assured caused me to be assured mm -hmm. that every single one of them have been thoroughly and properly vetted so that we will have the right people coming in, 
because even the pictures in the newspapers may not be enough. Somebody in the know may have missed the newspaper on that day. Correct. Or they may have read the comic strip rather than the other earlier pages or the horoscope. You understand? Yes. So it is up to the police commissioner to mm -hmm. ensure working along with the defense force and all the other agencies, we do vetting on a regular basis. And right. they have to make sure that that is done so as to get the right fit because policing is a profession, it's a, it's a vocation, it's, it's, it's more than ordinary. It requires certain attributes. Yes. I mean, the, in the spirit of righteousness. And, and I agree with you totally. Then these same physically trained officers, based on what you've just described, are released to protect and serve. Some of them, some are mentally unfit, physically incapable, some have even been known to be perpetrators, stressed out. They are planned. You know, I recall the days way back in the day when I was entering the police service. So you learned something new this evening. Yes. Um, you had to be a certain height. You had to be a certain weight. When you saw a police officer back in the day, you knew that it's either in the police service or the defense was something. Now we, we, we've seen some that um, the breeze could move them. Well, you know, the modern organization, as I understand it, I'm no police officer, but from my reading and my understanding mm -hmm. of it, it requires tremendous more in terms of skill sets okay. than in our day because the criminal fraternity has evolved into a very sophisticated, well-oiled machinery. Very strategic. Young, you know, they, you don't, they, you don't see nobody looking like a, you looking like no criminal again. Some clean, well-cut yes. people yes. in suits, because crimes are a reflection of human behavior. As I said that earlier. Yes. So you have white-collar criminals, you have blue-collar criminals, so-called. You have street, red blood criminals. You have yeah. them in all shapes. All shapes and, and sizes. And sizes. So the police organization today requires different kinds of skill sets. And some of the little ones who you, you small body want, because this height thing, it used to exclude people who may have the will and the capacity to ah, do so it. So it's finding the right balance. Yeah. And of course, uh, you know, I know a couple of police officers. They look like students. Mm. I know a police officer in particular. When I look at him, I can see a teenager in school. Mm. That's a good look. He could do some, mind. He could do good undercover work. Right. You understand? Understood. Mm -hmm. So how are officers uh, monitored so and evaluated? They, they require different kinds of skill sets. Mm -hmm. And today the focus is more on that rather than the physical attributes. You know, some of these young people, you might see that they might be very skilled in information technology Correct. and doing different aspects of policing today. Even counseling requires a lot of that, the police service. Understood. As, people who are good in theology and all of that too all of that yes sorry that's okay how are officers monitored and evaluated well um i am aware from the mm -hmm. outside as minister of national security that in all those organizations you mm -hmm. have appraisal systems and they are you know okay. uh, they are rated and um assessed by their managers corporals and sergeants and there's this, uh, these reports mm -hmm. and it eventually comes up and then they go for their interviews and okay. write promotion exams and interviews. It's a very systematic course, approach. Yeah, yeah. And of course, if a man is not footing the bill, it is open to the commissioner. Under the current law, the commissioner has the responsibility to hire and fire every police officer from the rank of assistant commissioner and down. So the commissioner is expected and they do keep a, a paper trail on, mm -hmm. as I say, your appraisal reports, reports that come awesome. in, disciplinary charges, and all of these things are kept in a file, and it is open to the commissioner following the tenets of administrative law and the constitutional law of Trinidad and Tobago to take action against a police officer who is demonstrating incapacity. If it is because of physical or health issues, yes. then there are procedures for medically being medically un boarded right. and mm -hmm. to be declared medically unfit, unfit. So it's, it's that sort of thing. Let's discuss <clears throat> the implementation of body cams for officers. It's been has it been tried and tested, and what's the delay in further yeah. implementation? Yes, I recall recently the yeah. commissioner reminding us that uh, within recent times, 
um, body cams have been purchased, distributed to the frontline officers of the police okay. service. It is not yet the case that every officer has one. Okay. But in the key areas where they are in direct contact with the public on a daily basis, the task forces, the CIDs, mm -hmm. the IATFs, they are the front, the detectives and so on, who interface directly with the public. They have been issued okay. and they are in vogue, they are in use as we speak. And it has helped. It has helped to improve accountability because sometimes ah. people lie like crazy on police officers too, you know. I agree. And it of goes course, both ways. In some cases, yes, police officers tell lies too. So this is a very helpful mat matter for transparency. And um, I still don't understand why it took such a high place in the considerations for Trinidad and Tobago, but this body cams, body cam became this big, big issue. To me, that's just like another piece of kit. It's it's necessary, it's useful, and I would like to see the process continue, and I'm sure it will. I've been assured by the commissioner it will. Wonderful. It's been years since the discussion on the table regarding, you know, these cameras at traffic lights on the highway, etc., and there are a few um, that aren't working, and we would recall the cyclists who would have died around the savannah um, got run over, and the lights weren't working. Is there anything in place to check these lights, to monitor what's taking place? Because you have a lot of lights that just aren't working. You mean traffic lights? The, the cameras by the traffic lights. Oh, well, cameras is one thing, the lights mm -hmm. is something yeah, else. Yeah, no, not the lights, the cameras by right. the lights, yes. All right, those cameras, we, we have about 1,676 of them across the country. And from okay. time to time, like every other piece of equipment, some would go down, sometimes people shoot them, mm -hmm. you know, um, they would just go bad. Things happen. Mm -hmm. uh, birds might go and lay nests wrong and inside of them where they can and so on. All these things happen. So it requires constant maintenance. The government recognizing that this camera system has not been serving the people of Trinidad and Tobago as well as they could we have taken action within recent times to hire a contractor to put 2,500 modern application cameras around Trinidad and Tobago. That work is ongoing as we speak. I met with the stakeholders up to last week okay. and I'm happy to report to you that in a matter of a few weeks we will see the beginnings of the rollout of that and begin awesome. to get the benefit of an improved CCTV system, which as a piece of technology um, is of great value to the police because the police yes. have reported to the government that there were occasions when there was a camera, a crime would have been committed, yes. and it was not able to assist the, the police. Footage. So we, the government, is taking that action, and it is on the way as we speak. Just by way of an example, they say, and I lived there for seven years, when you leave your home in London mm -hmm. and you go to your workstation and you return, you would have been recorded on average about 54 times. Yes. So if you committed a crime, you are very likely to be caught. And if you try to put up an alibi and say, I wasn't here hmm. at Victoria Station, for an example, camera showing you what you was day. Most present. You see what time you come and what time you leave. Yes. That ain't gonna work. And we, like England, have laws that will allow footage from these cameras to yes. be used in court as evidence against perpetrators. So as we improve this camera system, along with the very activist policing that I'm seeing now, yes. these things will go a long way in making this country the safe and the uh, a better place that the commissioner has spoken about. That is good news and I want to applaud the TTPS for that. We we have nine minutes and I need to get these two questions in and then get to the Facebook Live. Minister, I'm about to delve in some sensitive waters. Um, a young man or woman in what is deemed to be a hotspot who may not even have an ID card or a passport can be found in possession of one of these high-level guns, you know, these guns that are weighing them down they're heavy so clearly they got it from someone bigger than them so we are seeing young black men in particular carted off to prison daily i know you cannot go into much detail here however any progress with those the title their, their phrase they're bracketed as big fish as they are labeled and how long would it take for the right people to face the time as they are the root of the crime in most instances 
Um, let me say this, right? There's this perception of Mr. Big. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that is folklore. You think so? I think so. I so, think so. Uh, Minister? I think, I think that's folklore. You understand? Because no. I am aware from reports available to me, some uh-huh. of the littlest people uh-huh. bring gun in this country. Minister, the example has somebody who does not even have a passport. So they can't travel to Ghana where somebody no. is putting these guns in the hands of our young black people. No. I don't believe they're coming in. So where you, are they passing? Th- there's this perception that there's some big, rich, wealthy person in no, this country that guns. No, Mr. Big, no. Well, some, somebody that's big, how I, that's somebody how I bigger than you is the big. That's how I perceive it. Right. But you know, a little fisherman could just go down the mainland and come back with a container of guns under t- with, topped off with fish on top and shrimp. I agree. Good. But... Just now, uh-huh. some little fella, uh-huh. anywhere without the passport and without the ID card too, could get a cousin who lives in somewhere in the United States where guns are sold quite freely and legally like biscuits to send it for he in a container. And when it reach here, some little state official working in a courier firm or working for the state in some aspect of the state mm-hmm. could authorize that could turn a blind eye for that barrel to come here too. You understand? Agreed. Yes, I do. Okay. But it doesn't little, eliminate. Little, 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 little. So I don't know if it's I don't know if it's a big person, a little person. For me, it is all folklore. Gun coming in here illegally. Large, medium, or small, big, medium, small, miniature. I want it. I want the police to improve their techniques. I want the police to continue to be driven by the intelligence that drives them and to find every one of them. And I believe it is possible. Hence the reason why I applaud and I support the police services focus on retrieving illegal firearms in Trinidad and Tobago. I don't care who bring it. It's a gun. It's a lethal barrel weapon. It is Mm -hmm. a danger to the people in the community. Mm -hmm. It's a danger to all of us. I just want the police to go and find it. And I see the police carrying on operations whole day to day, whole of last night. I'm aware some more going down tonight and so on from what they from what I, I hear. The place is busy. I want to see more of that. Go and take every one of them guns and bring them in the police barracks by the Amara shop. And after six months, the police must show this country, look, we have captured three thousand guns, and to that extent the place is cleaner, safer and healthier. So that Better. is part of the solution of fighting this yes. crime. And that is what we need. Um, let's take some questions from the Facebook Live. Um, someone is asking, are there any plans to absorb municipal officers into the CTPS? Well, not necessarily. The municipal police as a concept and as a practice is going quite well. The government understood there's this supplemental, not supplemental, these municipal police. Mm-hmm. And um, when I was in opposition, when we were in opposition, Dr. Rowley, as opposition leader, sent me to Fairfax County in Washington. I spent three days and three nights with the police service there. They allowed me to drive around with them, to be in their precincts, to see how they operate. And there's where I saw how policing operates in the United States, at least in that. You have state police, Washington. You have county police, which is whom I was with. Mm-hmm. like all municipal police yes and as a result of that learning we took the decision that we will improve the body of municipal police so that to the extent that they grow and become more effective because they are properly trained they are properly armed and equipped they are well tooled for what they have responsibility for the city state properties mm-hmm. public spaces yes. and that sort of thing they deal with that quite effectively and that allows the regular Trinidad and Tobago police service now to focus on other things. So it is not about morphing one into the next. Right. An individual may have the ambition he wants to move from municipal police to TTPS. That's quite fine. But from a structural organizational standpoint, both have separate and collaborative roles because the municipal police mm-hmm. have emerged. I went to Stalin's... Um, Black Stalin's funeral or concert? Uh, the, the concert, concert. a mm-hmm. Tuesday night down there. Mm-hmm. And when I got into San Fernando and I saw the municipal police out mm-hmm. there doing the business, managing, maintaining the, the space, mm-hmm. 
Yes. I was quite pleased and I did tell the commission I was quite pleased and I complimented them because that's what it's all about. And therefore the regular police now would be free to go and deal with all the like the operations tonight and the other nights and so on. Excellent. And that's the idea. Everyone having their own responsibility, but they collaborate deeply with each other. Minister, I want to touch on school crimes. We have young people going to school with knives, um, in some cases a gun. How does the TTPS, if at all, work in tandem with the security for the schools? And should there be a more stringent way to highlight students who would, for example, enter the premises with a knife? There are too many, too many young people come into school with knives and all different types of weapons. Is, is, is that happening currently? Yes, yes. It's a very difficult situation because some schools got as far as having police present in the school within recent years. Wow, okay. We have MTS largely, the, you know, the MTS. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's a security company, company. operating mm -hmm. at these schools. Um, at some stages, I understand they had scanners. There were suggestions about scanners, scanners yes. for students. And then people raised issues about the children and that kind of policing environment in the school. It's a very difficult kind of situation. But what you have described is real. So as we speak, Mm -hmm. Discipline or ill discipline is a major problem in the system. Yes. And Minister Gatsby Dolly is grappling with it. So we have established the government, mm -hmm. a subcommittee, including me as Minister of National Security. Okay. And we work very closely with them as policies and practices are being designed, have mm -hmm. been, and continue to be designed to deal with the violence in schools of course in addition to that they have school counselors and guidance, yes, officers, guidance officers whose business it is to identify problematic students and to work with their with families and, their and family. in the communities to see how to address them that but is awesome. certainly our position is if you you could be child as you want mm -hmm. if you are going to commit serious crimes in the school environment you're going to rape, you're going to stick up, you're going to rob, you're going to shoot. Mm -hmm. you're go in school, you will be dealt with in accordance with the laws oh. of Trinidad and Tobago. And rightfully so. And then you'll be given the program for rehabilitation and treatment. And, and of course, we, you know, we have the Youth Training and Rehabilitation Center for the more extreme and violent cases because they can be very violent. As I say, that's what we're teaching them. That's what we're teaching them on a daily yeah. basis. And when I say daily, I mean sometimes when parents are asleep 24 hours a day, these children wouldn't go to sleep, you know, two, three in the morning. Yeah, they're on the their devices. Minute, you know, all manners of perversion. So they're getting sick, they're looking normal, but they're acting strange. Correct. Um, mm. You just mentioned something very interesting that I want to touch on, and then I'm going to allow you to make your closing comments. You spoke about the mindset of the individuals as it relates to having an issue with the scanners at the school. And the issue is coming from the parents, I gather, or maybe the students. But these same individuals have no issue being scanned to go to the United States. I think it's a mindset thing. Yeah. However, if, if that is something that the TTPS and by extension your ministry sees will be a deterrent to crime, then we have to start to ignore the naysayers because everybody, somebody will always have something to say. What are your closing comments? Well, I agree with you, you know, if it has to be done, it has to be yes. done. There was a time when corporal punishment was available to the staff at schools. I mean, mm -hmm. I was a beneficiary of some of that, even in secondary school, you know. I met a teacher of mine, Mr. Gart Nicholas, who, as a fifth form student, wanted to fix me up, you know. So, of course, I was a little yeah. bit embarrassed, so I escaped him. Right. And then I went to him quietly after and apologized and so on. But I couldn't take no licks in front of everybody. As a wow. Friend. You understand? But I didn't fight with him. I didn't cuss him. Mm -hmm. I escaped him. And then I went back peaceably and apologized and awesome. so on. Awesome. Yes. Minister? So my closing comments, yes. um, you know, I believe that um, the activist policing that I'm seeing now is taking us a long way. All of their strategies, I'm not at liberty to tell you oh, what I have learned there. Yes. Are. Yes. But um, once I, uh, I'm very happy about that. Awesome. And I'm looking forward to the future. I think, as I conclude, mm -hmm. that um, that is the platform that is responsible for preventing and deterring crime. Mm -hmm. And the government is doing other things. I mean, look, today I was quite pleased to see this police officer showing courage, a fellow called Samuel yes. out in Maloney with some stabbing incident. He yes. went in there unarmed. 
and subdued a man who can have murdered a woman and the child. And finally, the judiciary is taking action because we have to quicken the criminal justice system. So when the police bring them, the courts, and I awesome. know, I'm aware as we speak, the Chief Justice announced the establishment of the Special Court for Human awesome. Trafficking and Sex Offenses and so on. So the thing is getting better, and therefore in the midst of all of the noise, I am very optimistic and I'm looking forward to the immediate and the longer term future in terms of law enforcement in Trinidad. Thank you so much, Minister. And we have to wrap up. We would not be able to take any more of your questions. Thank you to everyone that would have tuned in. Thank you to Mrs. Ola Christopher, the Honorable Mr. Fitzgerald Hines, and everyone who has been a part of this discussion. My name is Wendy H. Lewis. Thank you for joining us. Good night. Take a trip now. We are the sound of a hundred thousand coming on the road. We are the vibration that you feel when the music.